Hi, I'm Terry Tomlin. In this series, we take a journey inside the Florida Aquarium to join wildlife experts, educators, and students just like you on a mission to entertain and educate while inspiring stewardship for the natural environment. Together, using science and research, we'll increase our knowledge and expose some myths by venturing inside the fascinating world of sharks, sea turtles, oysters, fishes of the wetlands, and marine mammals. These species all help inspire us to protect and conserve the world's priceless marine animals and their environments. So let's take the plunge on a learning adventure that explores these amazing wonders of our undersea world. This is the Florida Aquarium's Tanks to the Ocean, an educational web series brought to you by the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. The Eastern Oyster, or Edible Oyster, is a widely popular seafood dish in North America. Go to any seafood restaurant along the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts and you'll see the impact oysters have on our culture and our economy. But what role do oysters play in the natural environment? This episode reveals how important oysters are to people, as well as the vital roles they play as a food source and habitat for many other marine creatures. My name is Chris Smith. I am Public Affairs Manager at uh, the Mosaic Company here in Florida. It's important for Mosaic to be partners with the Florida Aquarium and Tampa Bay Watch because they're two very popular and well-known organizations here in the Bay Area that um, give back to the community uh, and Mosaic wants to be partners with them because we like to give back to the community too. They both focus on environmental education and so today we're out uh, building an oyster reef with Tampa Bay Watch and um, teaching our employees who are volunteering the importance of the oyster reef, how it cleans the waters of the bay. And with the aquarium being here today, you know, we've worked with the aquarium because they also teach uh, the public about the bay and about the environment. And some of our students from around the state that we work with at the schools uh, go to the aquarium so they can also learn the importance of environmental education. You know, the volunteerism is a must because it just doesn't get done. You know, these organizations totally rely on volunteers and it's important for Mosaic to volunteer because our employees want to be involved. They want to make a difference in the environment uh, by building Oyster Reef or by teaching kids about the environment and learning more themselves. So. Uh, it's so important to be involved in your local community. A single oyster can filter up to 10 gallons of water every hour. They help the water in the bay stay clean and clear. Uh, my name is Peter Clark. I'm the president of Tampa Bay Watch. Tampa Bay Watch is an environmental nonprofit program that was organized 21 years ago to provide the opportunity for citizens and community groups to come out and restore water quality and habitat back into the Tampa Bay estuary. I think oysters are particularly appealing to people that have the hunter-gatherer instinct in them. I mean, these are the bounty of the sea. Uh, they may not be purdy, but when you break them open, you have this wonderful, tasty piece of meat uh, that you can put on a cracker and enjoy. My favorite is, is raw, uh, but I'll eat them just about any way uh, people happen to serve them up. And, they're a tremendous resource from the sea. The oyster communities have been removed from the bay uh, in very, very large quantities historically. And it's natural for people to think of harvesting and eating the oysters is why we lost them. But in fact, we used to dredge up large areas of oyster bars and use those for construction material. So now what we're doing is we're replacing the hard bottom area for oysters to grow that will then allow water quality improve enough that we hope that people will be able to go back someday and harvest and consume these oysters. But our intent right now is to rebuild the habitat and improve water quality in the bay. But long term, you know, we would like this to be a community resource for all of us to enjoy. When we build oyster bars, a lot of times people think we're building them to eat, and these are the types of oysters that we can eat. But because they're water quality filters, they also can filter out the pollutants that would not be good for people. 
but it's our ultimate goal someday that these oyster communities that we build will improve water quality in Tampa Bay enough that you and I can go out and harvest and eat these oysters because these are edible oysters, but it really depends on the water quality that they're sitting in at the particular time. These oysters grow together and form a reef, and when they do that, it gives the opportunity for a lot of other fish and wildlife resources to live in and amongst these oyster communities. You can see there's lots of holes where uh, shrimp, uh, amphipods, which are very important for feeding sport recreationally, important species of fish and wildlife. Uh, crabs live in these oyster shells. Um, so the fish will come up here on a high tide and feed in these oyster shell areas. But also on lower tides, the birds will come down here and work their way through the oyster bars, picking out the different shrimp and the amphipods and all the other little critters that live in there. And if they're lucky, they'll be able to work their way into an oyster shell and maybe get out the, uh, the meat itself. American oyster catchers are one of those wonderful species of birds that depend on hard bottom habitat in estuaries and shoreline areas like Tampa Bay as a foraging area for them to find food. American oyster catchers have these really thick three to four inch orange, bright orange bills that they can use, they're almost as thick as pencils, to work their way into an oyster bar. Now an oyster catcher, he'll work his way into that oyster and pull out the meat if he can. But within these little niches that he can find in the oyster bar, he can work his way in and also find a lot of the critters that live in and amongst the oyster bar. So the American oyster catchers is one of those species of birds uh, that depends on high quality habitat out in the Tampa Bay estuary that we can provide and create by building these uh, oyster reef communities back into the Tampa Bay estuary. Oyster habitats in Tampa Bay are very important for fisheries. Um, a lot of our recreational uh, sport fishermen will target oyster bars, uh, especially things like redfish and spotted sea trout and snook will go to these hard bottom areas looking for the shrimp and other organisms that live in amongst the oyster bars for food. Redfish will work its way around the bar and try to suck out some of the critters that live in there. But a sheep's head is a whole other kind of fish. Sheep's head have very hard, flat teeth that can grind into oysters themselves and pull out the meat. They're very well adapted at coming into an oyster bar and finding some of the smaller oysters and barnacles and literally gnawing through the shell in order to find the food uh, that they would eat uh, within the oyster bar. So these are, these are very important for water quality and the habitat they provide, but they're also a great foraging areas for recreationally and commercially important species of fish. Too much carbon dioxide is causing the ocean to become acidic, so oysters are having a hard time developing their shells. Hi, my name is Andy Likens. I'm an environmental scientist with Tampa Bay Watch. An oyster is part of a large group of animals that lives in the ocean. They're called mollusks. Uh, all mollusks have similar characteristics, so uh, some sort of shell or remnant shell, uh, a soft body, and they also have a muscular foot. Uh, your most common traditional mollusk is the sea snails, so the things you see crawling around at the beach with a big shell on their back. Um, but also uh, you have bivalves, which are scallops and oysters and mussels and clams, anything with tooth shells. It's got a real strong muscular foot that opens and closes that shell. Uh, it's got two siphons that come in and out of the body. That's where it gets its name from, bivalve. Bi is two, and valve is that, uh, that siphon that comes in and out of its body. So a lot of things that people are familiar with, if you think of going to restaurants and, and what you can, uh, can eat at restaurants for seafood, a lot of those are these mollusks. And if you ever go to the beach, another one that's a, a real cool one, there are small little, uh, little bivalves that are in the, uh, the surf zone, so right, right where the water is washing, and they're called coquinas. So other types of mollusks other than what I've already listed include uh, a lot of your sea snails, so those are called uh, gastropods or univalves, they have that one shell. Uh, so you've got things like lightning whelks. We see a lot of crown conchs around the oyster bars that we make, as well as those lightning whelks. Uh, you have horse conchs, conchs and whelks, uh, all sorts of, uh, of animals like that. And also, some that people don't realize are our family. It's called cephalopods. It means they're head-footed. So they have uh, tentacles on their head. And, and if you think of tentacles, you might think of octopus and squid and uh, cuttlefish, chambered nautilus. They live real deep down in the ocean. So those are actually members of the same big overall group of animals, that one uh, phylum of animals. Oysters are filter feeders, which means that they pull water into their body. 
take out what they want and spit the rest out. Um, oysters feed on a lot of different algae, um, which are little plankton. So a plankton is something that is floating around in the water and it is drifting with the currents. It might have its own locomotion, but it can't go where it wants to go. It goes where the, the currents push it. And when that water runs by an oyster bar, those oysters will take that water in and, and pull out any of the food that they want out of that water. And like I said, spit out water that has less in it. The life cycle of an oyster is kind of an interesting journey, if you will. Um, when oysters are born, they're plankton. So what I, I described already is something that's drifting in the currents. And we call them spat. Um, sounds kind of funny, but, uh, but that's the name for them. And they will float around um, at first a little higher in the water column because they're so small. And as they grow, they get heavier and heavier and sink down further and further. And they will get to the point where they need to attach to a surface. So once they run into a surface that they like, they'll actually grab onto it and they literally will glue themselves in place. And we call animals that are glued in place sessile organisms. So that means they're not going to move anymore. They're stuck where they are unless a storm or a human moves them to another spot. And once they stick to place, that's when they start to grow. Um, a lot of people think that shells that you find in the ocean come from some crazy animal in the deep ocean. But like we've said, they actually come from mollusks and they build their own shell. So they will actually take calcium carbonate out of the water and they will secrete that. So they will move that out to where their shell layer will be built and they will build as they grow. Um, and oysters have, have a lifespan maybe of about four to five years or so in the wild. And during that time, they can get fairly large, you know, maybe three or four inches long, depending on your species and location. There are a few different ways to uh, refer to, to a clump of oysters or a place where oysters are. Um, Today we're talking about oyster bars, which is literally what we're building. This is a, a long bar that's going along the shoreline. And the bar is actually uh, one of our terms that we use to talk about the oysters maybe before they turn into our oyster reef. And our oyster reef really talks about um, something that's along the edge of our shoreline, that's protecting the shoreline and providing that habitat that's coated in oysters and looks real natural. Whereas an oyster bed will be say a circle of oysters is out in the water um, that you would find out there and it's a, a round clump they're naturally occurring in round clumps um, out in the water you can see them as you're going back and forth on the boats uh, to, to the site where we're staging the project from oysters might not look like the most glamorous organism that are out there they're kind of kind of grayish brown they look fairly drab but if you like sharks if you like going fishing out in the bay if you like seeing sea turtles if you like seeing stingrays any of those animals you kind of have to like oysters because oysters are what provides food for, for a lot of these animals. Oysters are what's cleaning the water, making habitats a little better for these animals and making these animals come to them. So they're, they're kind of drawing in everything. So they don't need to be overlooked. And a lot of times these animals are, so they're very, very important. And uh, they're super cool animals. And, and uh, there's a lot to learn about them and a lot to know and a lot to like. Why don't oysters give to charity? Because they're shellfish. Hi, I'm Tristan and I'm with the education department here at the Florida Aquarium. Now you may have learned earlier in the episode that oysters are a great habitat. They're also really important in filtering water. Now here in the bay, we have quite a bit of oysters. Now if we take a closer look at our food web, which we've created over here, you'll notice that oysters are at the bottom as well as other things like clams and mussels because bivalves in general are good at filtering water. Now what they will do is as they're filtering, they're also eating at the same time. So on the, our food web here, you might see some types of plankton such as phytoplankton and zooplankton. Now as the oysters consume these, they're also cleaning the water, but if you start taking away the oysters and the other bivalves, what you're gonna notice is your whole food web is going to shift and change. Because there's no oysters to eat the plankton, you're gonna start to have too many zooplanktons, which are gonna eat up all your phytoplanktons. So we'll make our phytoplankton disappear. And without phytoplankton, our zooplankton aren't gonna have anything to eat, so eventually they're gonna start to disappear. And as you might have learned earlier, that's gonna affect many other animals like crabs that start their life as plankton, smaller fish, and even up to large mammals like our whale. 
So I challenge you to do your part to help the environment. There are simple things you can do at home, like watching the amount of fertilizer that's used on your yard. If you guys have pets at home, make sure you're picking up after your dogs as you walk them around the neighborhood. Even simple things like helping your parents wash the car in the lawn, that's a great way to filter out a lot of that soap before it reaches the bay and other bodies of water. Other things that you can do are getting involved with local organizations. There's volunteer opportunities here at the Florida Aquarium, as well as with Tampa Bay Watch. It's always fun to get out and get a little dirty while helping the environment. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you here at the Florida Aquarium. This series is presented by the Florida Aquarium with generous support from the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. We thank you for watching. For more information or to donate, please visit us in downtown Tampa or online.